Nature Works Podcast. Conversations with extraordinary guests who are working to protect, regenerate, and better understand the natural world. With your host, Mike Weeks. Welcome to NatureWorks Podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking with Srina Karani, who is an environmentalist, an engineer, a climate policy advocate and investor, and who earlier this year entered a campaign for United States Congress. And she's only 29 years old. I spoke to her here in the Valley office, where she was taking a month away from the US to look for green ventures for her investment platform. And I don't say this very often, but I was deeply impressed. Now, if you enjoyed this episode and others, please share with like-minded folks who actually give a crap about the natural world. NatureWorks podcast is, as always, free of sponsors or advertising. And our aim really is to provide honest and unbiased insights into how we can all help protect, restore and regenerate this natural world that we and our children and our children's children will rely on. That colour in the background. It does look a bit shrine-like, this. Yeah. So there's usually a TV, that big 64-inch TV that you see out there. Yeah. That usually lives on here. Uh. But because of that, it created a metallic sound. Okay. And so we had to pull out everything plastic, and then we were left with this space that was just empty and black. And that you kind of needed to... So these are pictures my kids... <laughs> <laughs> my seven-year-old painted me these i quite like that one yeah that's his attempt to paint the universe which is as good as any that i've seen um and these flowers are from the farm so ah. welcome this is the first time that we've had this set up so my husband is an amateur photographer and so he's constantly like telling me all about like composition and framing and things like that and apparently <laughs> the evens are ugly like we actually, we think we want symmetry in the sense of like two things, like evenly spread, but it's actually like. Come on, let's do this. Like a, some it looks sort of ridiculous. Yeah, but, like but like but look at that. That's already. Oh yeah. A little, bit better. You know bit, what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like you actually don't want things. The to beauty be of in, asymmetry. Yes. A beauty of chaos. We move let's turn that. Let's turn it vertical. Vertical. Perfect. That looks more like the universe now. There we go. Yeah. How's yeah. that? Well, and and when I came in yesterday, that photo was about an inch lower than that one, and they fixed that for me. A Maybe wonderful we actually handyman. want it. Look, we could even get more creative we like that. Like Look take at that. one. Can I take one off? Yeah, I don't know. No? It might be no, a bit no, messy no, no, behind no, no. there. Okay, okay, okay. All right. I mean, okay, you could if you wanted to. Well, but let's, let's, let's try. Go on. That was just a screw. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. I don't bad. even think you can tell. Okay. Look at that. You're gonna, to gonna put the universe up. No, no, I think she's gonna ignore it. Well, it's she's gonna have a hole in the wall. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I, don't, I can't. It doesn't have the, the hook. We are um, uh, coming to you live from the podcast room with Srina <laughs> Karani doing uh, interior design, and yeah. I'm kind of digging it. Yeah, I mean, let's do that. There we go. If we get that. a big. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Flower. The uh, the symmetry was not not working for me. So is it the engineering mind that um, that creates symmetry, you think? I think so. And I think we we want things to be equal. I feel like our like our biology wants things to be equal, but it's actually not pleasant to the eye. We want certainty, don't we? We do. So I'm we writing do. a talk at the moment for uh, the Blue Earth Summit, which I'm speaking at in October in the UK. And the thing that popped up for me a couple of days ago, because I'm talking about um, environmental monitoring, microbes, like we've just spoken about on the farm, but I realized that as humans, it's not actually, we're, we're in this panic about nature and climate change. But when the, the long term, we've heard this said many, many times, the long, the long term um, outcome of the planet is not really any of our business because we're talking millions of years, right? We're just here for a tiny little brief moment. It's not actually the planet that most people are worried about. It's our relationship to it. It's it's the absence of of um, honeybees as they relate to us. Most people are, are not wanting to leave the planet uh, voluntarily, which would be the ideal situation if we gave a shit really about natural systems. But none of us want to do that. You know, it's a it's a much more selfish motive. And I think whatever motive actually gets us there, then then great. 
I was going to say, I think it's actually not altruistic at all because, yes, it's our relationship with nature, but even more so, it's our quality of life on this planet that we're actually more worried about, right? It's like nature will survive. Maybe it's a little less habitable. Maybe we have less species and less biodiversity, but the, the planet Earth will survive and nature, to a certain extent, will survive. Will we survive will we enjoy surviving on this planet is the bigger question and i think in that sense it's not it it, it very much is a selfish mission yeah i guess it's the equivalent of living in a gray dark gray box like this which is now very beautifully decorated (laughs) on the interior i will have to add yeah (laughs) or having the diversity of different colors and textures and and the likes and in fact Funnily enough, the reason I put this this white wall up behind you, and we had two, was because I brought in one of my kids' tutors in here because I needed to have a private meeting with her. And she, walked, I said, oh, you know, you can always use it in here if you need a space with the kids. And she said, it's too depressing. Well, and that's that's actually a really interesting point. So one of my first research projects was actually with NASA, right? And we were trying to figure out how we can have, have a shirt sleeve environment uh, in one of the lunar outposts that they were planning. And when you talk, like when you think about what that means, it's literally so we could sit here in our shirt sleeves and be comfortable and feel at home as much as that's possible. And one of the biggest challenges was you're in the Shackleton crater on the South Pole of the moon and lunar days and nights are effectively the equivalent of two weeks of Earth day and Earth night, right? And so one Wait, lunar one two, lunar day yeah. is two weeks, two, two Earth weeks. Okay. Yeah. Well, and so you have an... an and, and is that because of the speed of the rotation of the moon? Versus- and where the, the, the crater is located on the South Pole okay. is, is more of it. Um, so just the same way that when you're in... I don't know, closer to the tropics, closer to the equator as we are now. Our days have different lengths and are tend to be a bit shorter, especially in the summers compared to somewhere closer to the North Pole, for example. Um, but the, the most difficult part was accounting for like extreme heat and extreme cold, right? So what did it mean for humans to be able to be in a box on the South Pole of the moon and live comfortably so they could walk around in their shirt sleeves, right? And so when you're talking about, you know, tutoring in a box like this, it's what is it that makes us comfortable to be able to live somewhere? And that includes temperature, but that also includes, I think, for us to be truly happy. It's it's the exposure. It's different experiences. It's the colors and your senses and the smells. Um, and I think that that's something that we will very much miss <laughs> if we continue on the path that we're on right now. Yeah, I agree. And I think it was... Um, uh, some of our listeners may get a bit bored of me mentioning him. Yvonne Schunard, who's the founder of Patagonia, one of the his book "Let My People Go Surfing" was the one that really mm. turned for me my attention on building businesses to be successful from a profitable perspective versus doing good in a world with dwindling resources. But he makes the point again and again that you won't protect what you don't love. And I'm an environmentalist accidentally because I grew up in a very poor part of the UK, but I was lucky just by the fact that my grandparents moved to this tiny little house in the, in the council area. I was lucky that it had woods and fields right next to it. A small enclosed area that to this day is actually still protected. And, um, and that gave me access to nature. I think the problem we have now is that so many young people live in cities with no exposure to nature whatsoever how can they ever love something enough to want to protect it it's like an alien world if you if you love a city if you live in a city like new york i know you've got the big parks there but it's still not the same as being able to go and lose yourself in the hills and um and i think that is one of the biggest challenges is not just us being able to come up with solutions it's how do we bring everyone on board uh, we we have it here where people th- still throw their garbage in the subaks in the river systems as we were talking about earlier. It's not good enough to put garbage traps in like we're doing. It's not. It's not. I mean, it's scalable, but that's not the solution. The solution is to stop people putting the garbage in. So right. so it goes back to the whole education piece. But education and and how do you provoke or how do you motivate people to actually give a shit, right? And I think it is connected to a certain extent, right? Like here, 
I think there is a much greater appreciation, whether it's more spiritual, whether it's just because of mm. where you live and because you're surrounded by rice paddies and and you do feel you're not you're not in a concrete jungle like you would be in Manhattan, right? And so I think there's there's still that connection, even more so than if you lived in a big city. But I think what's missing is maybe you could sort of classify it or put it under the umbrella of education. But I think it's even more so the fact that the world is becoming a lot bigger in a way, right? We're a lot more connected. When you put trash into the river system, it doesn't just impact the village over, which might get pissed off at you, but it's actually dumping into the oceans, right? And it's a connectivity that I think we haven't really had before. And then I almost feel like our brains are struggling to keep up with in a way is when you think about the world, I was just looking up, uh, you know, when we're going to reach 8 billion people on this planet and just thinking about 8 billion. When is it? I, f- I forget the actual date. I, I was just, I, it was one of those like random Googles when I was, was walking. It's and in a few years time. It's, it, it's, how much? Yeah, it's, it's not very far off actually. Um, and I remember when we crossed 7 billion and I was like, what? We're, we're almost at 8 billion people and I cannot comprehend what that even means. Mm. So there's a, there's a, so I'm going to come back to that. Look, I'm going to put 8 billion here because <laughs> I want to come back to it because um, I'll get shot by a number of people, not least of all our own team in Chicago who listen to these podcasts. If I don't go back in time to the point when you said, one of my projects where I worked with NASA, because <laughs> <laughs> I've interviewed some really great PhD scientists, but no one's mentioned NASA yet. What the hell were you doing with NASA? Yeah, this is a good question. So uh, it was my background is actually as a mechanical engineer. And so it was a, a design project um, where NASA works with people all across the United States. Um, and you have teams that are for, you know effectively working on these various design problems. Um, so you have everything from the design of something all the way through to the actual implementation. And so our project was on the design side. Um, and it was for a lunar outpost that uh, NASA was, I don't know if they've actually sort of where they're at yeah, in their, careful, careful, yeah, exactly. Careful. I was like, I, I don't know how much. We just revealed classified information. <laughs> the dark side of the moon is being inhabited right now. <laughs> Joe Rogan would like that. That would be a conspiracy. That theory would that be. I know. I feel like this is this is going down a different path. So there was path. a missile base so, uh, was there that you were all, designing. All and I'm saying aliens. is there is a oh there was a research research <laughs> outpost planned uh, for the Shackleton Crater, which is on the south side of the moon, and uh, in order to have humans there for longer periods of time to actually be able to do research and, and be on site and things like that. Um, it was actually one of those projects that ultimately pushed me to not be as interested in space. I think at the time I was like, oh, this is like, this is my career. I'm going to, you know, grow my way through NASA and build all these things and do all these amazing things in space. Um, And I'm still fascinated by space. But I think it was actually the project that made me realize that we were effectively building air conditioning for a lunar outpost. Um, And there were a lot of problems here on Earth that I I thought needed, you know, solving first. Mm. We have a video in our YouTube channel called There's No Trash on Mars. Mm. And it's essentially talking about the progress of humanity since tools. And now we can go to Mars, potentially, with people. But really, when you get there, there's not going to be any trash. There's not going to be any uh, diversity loss. There's not going to be any of the problems that we're facing here. And all of that money and all of that effort and all of that... A, a focus into going somewhere else to me seems absurd. I get it from the spirit of adventure. I've been an adventure most of my adult life, but the idea that you would go to a, a dusty, empty planet and spend billions of dollars doing it whilst you've got all of these problems here that, I mean, I get it. Elon Musk, for instance, and I don't, I'm not scared of naming people, um, He's doing his cars and that will make a big impact and he's doing the solo and that will make a big impact. But there's still dozens of other problems that people like him with that amount of capital and resources could be uh, approaching rather than trying to send people up into space. So I, I try and go second position on him, meaning I try and think from his perspective. He said on a number of occasions that he's concerned that we will go extinct if we don't go interplanetary. And I also love the idea of being interplanetary. You know, if I could just jump in a jet tomorrow and go for a spin around, but not if it's going to take me away from Earth for two, three, four years when all the problems are here. 
Would you go as an astronaut? Yes. If you could, you would? Yes, yeah. I would. Would you go to I Mars? Would. I would. Yeah. You don't have kids. I don't have kids. What, I would, have... You, what would you do when you get there? <laughs> you know, it's it's a good question. And I think it is a bit of this like frontier, right? That's just, there's something about it that's so novel and that's so exciting. Um, but I do agree that I think the novelty would wear off quite quickly. But there's something about it just to say, just to be able to, you know, to go that I think would be incredible. But I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying before, Um Around, for example, for Elon Musk, so for someone who has so much capital, so much resources, so much engineering know-how to actually tackle some of the bigger issues we're facing here on Earth. And I think that points back to one of the one of the things you said earlier around how do we get people to care more about what's happening here? How do we get people to to feel passion and love for the world around us here so that they actually want to whether it's conserve or fix or maintain or grow, but whatever it is in a way that is healthy and that is actually sustainable. And I think that that I, I completely agree. That's one of the biggest challenges, even if we have all the capital in the world, all the smartest minds in the world, if they're not focused on those problems, we're not getting very far. How would you do it? Because you're obviously interested in leadership uh, at a political level. And part of that is actually convincing people to make changes. You can come into a co- into a a culture, and let's say a culture is a city or a town, or a, you can come into a culture and you can impose rapid, dramatic change. But it is very difficult for the co- prevailing culture to accept it. Uh, only in certain times like war or pandemics can we impose so heavily. And even then, you can see that there's an enormous pushback as well. So how would you, because you've obviously thought this through, how would you go about transforming people's understanding, appreciation, and more so their desire to actually start making differences that are going to impact positively? Yeah, I mean, I think behavior change, that sort of knowledge to action gap that we're seeing right now is one of the things that trying to convince someone to do something that they don't want to do that they don't feel like they've decided to do on their own is very, very difficult. Especially in America. Yep. <laughs> and <laughs> and to be honest, a lot of, especially from a, a policy position, right, a lot of that is actually not very interesting and is not around behavior change because it's around where what's our energy mix, right? How are we not continuing to explore and completely deteriorate our Alaskan wilderness in the search of crude oil, right? I think there's there's a lot that we need to do sort of systemically that, yes, we do require individuals to make their change and to, to sort of change their behavior, but there's a lot of things that we need to sort of tackle first, and that is going to have a much longer impact, at least in terms of how the climate is currently changing. Um, so I think my answer is, is not actually very exciting because it's not around individual behavior change. It's rather around what do we need to do from a federal jurisdictional level to actually start putting in place a lot of the systems that we need. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Right. I'm going to keep on with this one. Yeah. And just for some background, and I'll I give an introduction on you at the beginning of this um, that I'll record later. But for people who are listening now, what they'll... Uh, be wondering is why I'm asking you questions about state level or or even (laughs) national level policy. Um, And you obviously ran for Congress. United States Congress. Yes. And that was this year. Do you Mm -hmm. want to just touch on that for a minute about why why you did that, what your motives were? Yeah. So uh, I ran for U.S. Congress in California's 41st district. Um, So it's a part of California that is inland of Los Angeles. So if you sort of draw a straight line east from L.A., you'll sort of hit the 41st. You might be familiar with Palm Springs. It's like one of the more famous areas in the district. Um, But it's an area that has traditionally been quite conservative. And that's where I grew up. So I was born and raised there, went to school there, went to university there, earned my degree in mechanical engineering there. And it's an area that also doesn't have, when we talk about that sort of like passion and and hope and sort of commitment uh, to the community, it has for a very long time been represented by someone who doesn't necessarily align with those values and has been in for 30 years um, and is actually one of the most corrupt members of Congress by nonpartisan watchdog groups. So there's, there's a lot there that... Um, 
it was just sort of it was time for change and looking at where I grew up, looking at my friends, looking at my community and a lot of the issues that we're facing with, for example, um, going back to sort of like the the energy mix in the U.S. Um, and the sort of push now to actually electrify, right? Um, my district is adjacent to effectively one of the biggest uh, potential sources for lithium. And that could effectively power the entire green revolution in the U.S., um, and that's something that was not necessarily on the the agenda for uh, the our, our current representative. And does so, he, does he have shares in oil and gas? Companies? Yes. yes yeah. Yes. Yeah. And is incredibly well funded uh, by them yeah. as well. So, uh, I think there there's quite a bit of change that's on the horizon, and there he hasn't really ever had a true challenger that could actually go up against him. Um, but every 10 years in the U.S., there's something called uh, a census that's done uh, that sort of looks at the entire population and the lines are redrawn in California based off of the new numbers. And so our district was redrawn to actually uh, give us the voter base to potentially take him out. Um, obviously, I was unsuccessful this year. That's not to say that there might not be uh, another campaign on the horizon. Um, but especially as someone who believes that we need to use more science, more data to actually frame policy when we're talking about, you know, being able to grapple with 8 billion people across the planet. And then you look at 300 plus million people in the U.S. and the systems around waste, around water, around energy, around food and agriculture that are required. It is not something that you can kind of just, you know waffle around about you need to use real data, real numbers, real assessments to actually inform that policy. And that's something that is just not happening at the moment. So, so if it's not happening, how are they defining policy yeah. other than who's feathering their own nests? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Did I just and answer that? Yeah, you yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, of course, they they have to have some data to base it on, but it's data that's come heavily funded and heavily filtered. And Well, I mean, if you look at the number of scientists and engineers in Congress, there aren't very many of them. No. In fact, you get people throwing snowballs and saying right. that shows that there's no such thing as global warming. Right. Which is concerning. Yes. And then you get people like Donald Trump, of course, who is a well-known scientist. Of course. And mm -hmm. um, a deep, Very fact-based. A, deep, yeah. a deeply um, studious academic man who likes to make sure that he's got a balance of both sides and of the And understands the nuances, yeah. Understands mm. the nuances. I think probably should do a PhD in complexity science, understanding as he does the degree of complexity that are involved in the decisions that he makes in between drinking Diet Coke and looking in the mirror and brushing his bouffant. Yep. Yeah. Um, look, <laughs> uh, before we get too political, <laughs> and I don't mind getting political, by the way, that's the beauty of this podcast is that I actually don't mind going anywhere that's going to upset uh, people. But um, California, to most people on the outside, looks like the poster child of the movement towards a more progressive and more uh, ecologically and technologically sound um, world. Um, it's obviously the home of companies like Tesla originally and, and um, well, and still now. No, they moved to Texas, didn't they? I believe so. I Texas. think they moved there. Too yeah. much taxi. Yeah. Um, and environmental movements and everything from Whole Foods to, you know, Patagonia, for instance, the clothing store. And you see a lot of progressive people there. But earlier you were saying that the majority of this state is actually not like that. Yeah. In terms of uh, if you Google red, blue, California, red for Republicans, blue for Democrats um, and just Google image search that, then you'll see what California actually looks like. So in terms of the majority of the state per square foot is Republican. And you have uh, definitely the coasts that are very progressive. And I think because of that, because that's where most of the people are concentrated, the California state government is quite progressive and is, I think, in many ways sort of leading the U.S. Um, but how that breaks down in terms of the representatives, the delegation we send to the federal government, we're still only 52 or 53 representatives out of over 400. Right. And so California alone can't do very much. And especially from a federal perspective, is very much in the minority. Um, that being said, I do actually think the California state government is is really sort of pushing the boundaries in a lot of ways. Um, 
And I think that's where the sort of uh, global image for California comes from is because of what the state is doing. But in terms of the representation to the federal government, we're just one state of many. What on earth drives a... Uh, you're 30... 29, Oh, you're actually. 29, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I knew you were around 30, <laughs> something like that. What on earth drives a 29-year-old woman to want to go into that hornet's nest of mostly white elderly men with vast fortunes in their back pockets i think you just answered the question do i think our country should be run by mostly elderly men that are backed by mostly funding from companies that i do not necessarily believe have the best interests of our future in mind I I don't think so. And I think that we actually need to have more younger people running for office because it's sort of our futures that are at stake. I think things, especially in the U.S., yes, we I mean, we're already seeing more extreme climate events. We're already starting to see some some of the effects of climate change and some of the societal disparities that we have. Um, But things are for the most part going to sort of be okay for the next decade or two. Um, I think it's it's after that which in many cases might be after the lifespan of a lot of our members of Congress, is when I think about my grandkids and will we have to move to Mars, right? Like, I, think, I think that's the sort of question that is a lot more palpable for younger people because we still have more than a couple of decades to live and still have to sort of figure things out and make sure that um, our soil hasn't degraded to the point where we can no longer grow food. Right. Um, Our waterways are still clean. We still have actual drinking water. You know, these things are are issues that from just a sheer resource standpoint are a lot more at stake for younger people. Yeah, I think if we go back to what we were saying at the beginning of this conversation, which is about aesthetics and quality of life. I I don't subscribe to the idea that 100 years from now, the planet will be scorched earth and it will be mad max i just think it's it, we underestimate the resilience of plant species for instance and we also know and I've, i was just reading a study last week on this that the the increase in co2 there are some benefits to it from yeah. the fact that plant species grow now i don't want to sound like some um uh, climate denier because it's not about the um, degree of CO, it's not about the degree that the plants can grow, it's about the speed that the planet can handle it. And the, the planet can't handle the speed of release at the moment. Um, but it's that for me, when I think about how fortunate I've been, I'm 47 years old, and I know, I know, I don't look it. Um, I, and I, you know, I've had this incredibly fortunate life to travel the world. I've been to 56 countries, I've lived in some of the most pristine, beautiful, wild places. And for me, as a father of a 10 and 7-year-old, when I pr- project 15 years ahead and my kids go into places and going, Dad, it was just, you know, it was it had been destroyed by wildfires or it had been mm. destroyed. It was, it was, there was more plastic there than there was in the streams that we were cleaning up or, you know, we went there to see polar bears and they don't exist anymore. That, for me, is the bit that's untenable. Well, and it's not even 10 to 15 years, right? In California, there is no more fire season because it's right. always fire season, right? And is, that, is that the case now? Is it kind of officially yeah. the, the, in I the believe, middle winter I think you're the, still having them? I believe the Cal, the Cal Fire, which is the California State sort of fire organization, um, I believe they put out a statement a couple of months ago sort of saying it's spring and we have wildfires in what's supposed to be some of the luscious parts of the state. Wow. Right. And um, I got married. Is that because of a lack of water? Sorry. Is that a lack, a lack of it's rain? A mix, it, the- it's a mix of things. So it's not just a pure lack of rain that causes wildfires, but it can sometimes be a lot of rain that then causes plant growth. But then a really intense dry period, a pickup of winds that like a spark that might have happened anyways, now actually completely devastates a landscape because there's more ground cover or because, you know, for, for some other reasons. So it's not always just precipitation related, but it's precipitation biomass, like how much fuel is there that can actually burn and then forest management. So it's sort of between those factors that ultimately can create and a massive better, cuts in forest management. And mass cut. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but I mean, I don't know. My 
my husband's parents are, are German and they came to visit for our wedding, of course, and spent some time in California. It was their first time in the state. And uh, it was it was fire season. And it actually ruined their trip to a certain extent because they thought they were going to be visiting some of the most pristine parts of California and there's ashes falling from the sky, right? They, they can't actually see across the horizon because of all the smoke. And it's not just in 10 to 15 years. It's it's already happening. Mm. It's, it has been happening. Um, but I think our, our recency bias and a couple of other sort of human psychological uh, protections that we have in place sort of prevent us from getting really freaked out about it. We're like, ah, that was just a really bad year, you know, or that was just one they visited. Or it was just that time or that was a really big fire um, and not necessarily seeing the data points of a sort of acceleration of these events and how they're starting to no longer be a 50 year or a 100 year or even a 25 year, or 10 year, but an every year sort of occurrence. Yeah, the majority of humans are very poor at looking at patterns over the long term and seeing where they are in that we and you're absolutely right we have this immediacy bias where we can justify what's going on with any range of justifications that makes us think that it's only this time around it's a bit like being in an abusive relationship <laughs> and saying no tomorrow will be different and it happens again and again and again um and and i so I've studied complexity science quite in depth. I think the the current problem that we have is that you have a lot of different companies and people and entities and organizations all with their own way of approaching the current crisis that we have, environmental crisis. Everyone obviously has a stake in their own position, but there is no unifying overall agreement there's no unifying system to say, hey, look, if you integrate what you're doing with what we're doing over here, with what those people are doing over there, with what these people are, and this capital that is desperate to get into environmental, social governed projects, etc., then we could actually make some serious impact because together we'll be better. Uh, it still seems to me right now, and I'm, I'm leading into a question because I know you're working with different companies, still seems to me there's a certain competitiveness for the company to be the next tesla i want to be the first battery company rather than that we all need to yeah we need to make a living companies have to be profitable otherwise they're not companies um but there we need a new narrative which is that there needs to be some kind of cohesion because the problem's too big for any individual company to fix when when i see on twitter and i don't use twitter much but when i see on there that people are saying elon will save the planet it's like you're out of your minds and building teslas is actually it, it, it's still using a huge amount of resources building battery cars ain't going to fix shit it will fix pollution problems but this needs to be a cohesive approach to to the problem i completely agree and i think it sort of goes back to what you're saying around we sort of we need this sort of company front. We need this this united front to sort of move together with a cohesive vision because it's not really, it is too complex for one company to do it on their own. And especially when you're not sort of following a even baseline plan of an agreement on what our vision is, mm, right? Yeah. And uh, it was an interesting exercise. I did my master's in Sweden and uh, in, in sustainability. And um, we had the chance to work with a couple of local government officials um, to just ask them and effectively do an, a visioning exercise of, you know, you have this platform, you have these things that you're you're running on. What What is the goal? What are, where are we going with all of this? And it's it's a bit of an unfair question, right? Because it's it's a very complicated answer. But the issue is that we're so focused on what we need to do in, in this specific moment or a specific region or for a specific issue that we haven't actually taken the time to sort of sit down and create a cohesive roadmap that we can all relatively agree on. And I think it's particularly worse on the left side of the political spectrum than it is on the right, because I think the right per the nature of the platform is more conservative and it's about things that we're not going to do, right? Versus mm -hmm. it's a lot more difficult to say, okay, if we're going to clean up the waterways in Bali, what is the best way to do that? And how do we all agree to do it immediately? And you have an incredible operation and model of what you're building out here, but there might be others that come 
either already or in the future and say, this is this is better, right? And so even when you have a very specific, discrete problem, you're going to have a multitude of potential options. And I actually think to a certain extent that that's good. I think that competition can be healthy in that we can hopefully continue to iterate on what we need. Right. And for it to be better, for it to be more efficient, for it to be more cost effective. Um, and that's what we're actually working on, as you mentioned now, with Snowcap. So it's a, a venture capital firm that we're building that is effectively focused on the sectors that have high carbon footprints. Um, but we're not investing in the consumer facing aspects of those sectors or those verticals. We're actually focusing on higher up in the supply chain. So it's not investing in the Tesla, but it's investing in whether it be the batteries or it could even be the manufacturing facilities that actually allow them to sort of scale, right? And we're seeing that in food, we're seeing that in water management, we're seeing that sort of across the board, that scale can actually be one of the bigger issues in terms of actually pushing out an innovation and technology across the country or the, the globe. Um, and so by investing in making those processes more efficient and allowing more companies to iterate and have more sort of shots on goal in a way to actually solve the problem, I think is is actually necessary because we we don't have that vision. We don't have that roadmap. It's not that we have the the perfect blueprint that we just need to execute on. We still don't know exactly what it's going to take. And I think that's one of the sort of going back to the existential parts about climate change. It's not that the world's going to be on fire right in a couple of years it's just that we don't know we don't know how things are going to be put out of balance we don't know what um increasing heat waves is going to have an, an impact on our you know ice packs or on our freshwater streams we don't know how potentially shifting shifting to organic agriculture is going to actually impact food supplies like mm. we, we just don't know sri lanka like i said right and i think that's that's one of the biggest issues that with the climate is that we currently have had an insurance scheme for these past couple hundred years in terms of how post-industrial revolution, how our societies have developed and actually been able to really grow and, and extend human life, extend health, extend all of these things that give us the quality of life that we have today, at least in a, a more Western developed context. Um, but we still, we think that that is going to continue forever. And I think that's the a bit of the sort of individualistic, capitalistic uh, culture that we live in is that grow, 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 more, 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 um, without necessarily considering the sustainability of what if we don't have access to those same resources? What if we have more pandemics? What if these things happen because our sort of insurance has run out? And you, you have to be an optimist to be a capitalist, yes. because otherwise you wouldn't invest your money. Right. No, yep. you can be a realist as well, but that you have to, you can't be a pessimist because you will no. never invest in anything. No. Um, but obviously, we are seeing biodiversity loss and systems collapse and all of that. So the writing is on the wall. Mm. There's no doubt about that. But you're absolutely right. the 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 current necessity is to mitigate the potential risk. Yes. I mean, there are in some places like uh, I think. A couple of weeks ago, there was a report that came out that showed that the coral, the Great Barrier Reef is now renewing and growing at some incredible rate. And it, it, it shocked scientists because it goes counter to the narrative of the fact that all coral reefs are dying. Yep. Now, I interviewed Dr. Ian Hendy, who is absolutely, he's a world-class coral expert, mangroves and the likes. And he's a superb um, uh, scientist. And he was saying that what happens is that as the temperatures rise, and even as there's maybe some degree of acidity in the water, yes, some of the older species, or I should say the more prevalent species of coral, they will die. But there's always a species that comes in and fills the gap. And so you may even end up, it's a bit like getting rid of the neighbors who were okay, <laughs> and the new neighbors who come in are just really nice people who, who really care about community. You don't you don't know. Right. But the you may also get a bunch of thugs and hell's angels who move in next door. And so it's that mitigation of risk that we have to do through all of this. Well and, and there's the 
I think there's the natural sort of biological component, and then there's also the management component, right? So the, the human component of this. And um, if you look at, for example, for like deforestation curves for, uh, you know, tropical rainforest, for example, um, you actually often see sort of a steep decline to the point where this forest is almost gone, which is to, to a certain degree sort of what we saw with the reefs, right? And then people are like, oh, crap. We, we got to do something about this. Like we, we can sort of see through the line of trees now and then it immediately bounces back. And it's not to a certain extent, it could be that the forests are resilient or things like that. But for the most part, it's actually because we realize what mm. we've done. We can actually see the impacts of it. The, the reefs have been bleached. They started implementing a lot more measures against, uh, you know, agricultural runoff and dumping and things like that. They started actually taking care of the land as opposed to having it be a bit of a free for all. And then... When we take a bit of care, things can bounce back relatively easily, right? So I think that there is sort of this balance between nature's resiliency um, and our ability to not just keep extracting and not just continue to take, but to actually take care. It's a bit like the the deadline syndrome that so many people seem to... Right, right. I've, got a I've got a presentation <laughs> on Friday at 2 p.m., so... I'll leave the presentation until midnight on Thursday. On Thursday, and then, <laughs> and then I can crank it out. Thing. But then you crank it out in a couple yeah. of hours when yeah. you had 100%. 40 hours to work on it, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think, yeah, 100%. I think that that's something that we we sort of see in land management to a certain extent as well, where the systems are resilient enough to actually bounce back when we take care enough to let them. They do. So we've established your your political position to some degree and why i'm going to ask you the question if you had got into um the position of congress and and i'm not talking about from the social perspective unless it's linked now because this is mostly an environmental podcast and it, you can't not they can't not be linked just to be clear i'm not that you know um uh re re reductionist in my view but from a environmental perspective what would have been the first types of policies that you would have started pushing to integrate seeing as you're not funded by oil and gas companies thankfully not no um funnily enough i actually did one of my first jobs was actually working for the natural gas company uh and was a bit of my i, saw, I did see that yeah I was gonna ask you about yeah that. it was a bit of was one of my aha moments i was like oh crap we gotta we, we can't continue along this path and i have to sort of take a take a sharp left turn to get away from it um but i am thankfully not funded by by them or, or any other oil and gas company um yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's a bit of the answer that I gave before, right? It's it's our energy policy. And uh, even in the last bill that passed, which was sort of heralded as a great sort of step forward in terms of climate change, um, still accounts for supporting some oil and gas. And I understand that there is a transition, right? Like even when we're talking about transitioning land use and things like that, you there is a transition in place. And it's not that we can shut everything off in one day and expect everyone to change out their water heaters and their stoves and things like that all, all at once. However, uh, I think continuing to invest in oil and gas is not the direction that you we mean, need to be You on. mean new fields, mm -hmm. exploration. Mm -hmm. But do, do you, playing devil's advocate here, Obviously, there is a necessity for us to keep the the energy usage current, current the energy uses we currently have to keep it uh, certainly at the current operating models. Mm -hmm. Because we're seeing now in the UK, for instance, that people are terrified that when winter comes, they can't afford to heat their homes because there's been squeeze on gas from because of the Ukraine Russian war. And if right. Putin turns off the pipelines, does, then that's it. That's it. Yep. We're in deep shit. Um, the coal mines may start getting, you know, pulled, and that's a even bigger disaster. There has to be a transition. Yes. Um, obviously, it would be lovely if tomorrow we could just click our fingers and the switch would come on. I actually think there's a lot of potential in hydrogen. I've spent a lot of time mm -hmm. looking at hydrogen. Yes. Um, but we're not going to do it from just from the capability of renewables right now. Um, so the argument would be that we have to keep going after exploration of new oil and gas fields because what happens when the current ones run out and we're still not there? What do you say to that? That we haven't really planned for a phase down. 
right? We're, we're, we're maintaining at the moment. And if we are truly going to commit to a transition, then I think the studies, the research is there that we can actually sustain currently. So the new with, oil... With the reserves yes. we currently yeah. have. Yeah. For exactly. how long? I forget the exact timeline. There was a, a study that came out, I believe it was last year, that had actually mapped out the transition. So as to say, with our current reserves, the current rate of use, but actively investing both private yeah. and public sector in a transition to renewables, here's what it would take to actually get there. And it and it showed the curve going down, and oops, sorry, and the curve going up, right? So you you do... It seems like the roadmap is there. And once again, this is not something that I consider myself a, a full expert in, in terms of exactly when and how much and all of that. Um, but the current exploration is not for necessity's sake. It's not because we need more. Where would you, if you had access to large investment capital, well, you do because you work in a VC, venture capitalist <laughs> firm, don't you? But where would where do you think that the potential the most leverage in renewables can come from? So I think it actually depends on where you are. So I would actually, and this is one thing that I think the latest bill actually did well. So it was under the IRA, so the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but it effectively gave quite a bit of funding and uh, sort of broad authority to state governments. So, for example, uh, in California, solar actually works quite well, right? If we could increase the uptake in rooftop solar for residential, we actually would have pretty good grid stability um, and there's a decent amount of battery research that's also being done so that way we can actually, when accounting for demand response, we can actually balance out. Um, but that might not be the case in a less sunny state right um and so i think but i actually agree on hydrogen that i think that there's a lot of potential there and there actually is quite a bit of funding for hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, in the latest law which is quite exciting um but i think it, it really depends on on where you are and what the best sort of optimal renewable energy source is are you seeing in your vc fund are you seeing any a lot of energy startups or what, 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 I, I wouldn't say your... that there's like a particular uptick. I think that solar in particular has and battery tech has actually been on the rise. We're starting to see a decent amount more of tidal, uh, which is interesting. Um, and I think wave technology is a, a potential area. It is quite or can be quite capital intensive, um, which depending on where you are on the risk spectrum can put you onto it or off of it. Um, but I think the energy innovation has sort of is continues to be linear as opposed to exponential that may change with a new influx of investment between especially particularly talking about the us um with the last three laws that were passed pertaining to climate which effectively put in almost a quarter trillion of investment uh into technology so i think that there is a we, we do have an influx of capital coming, and I'm hoping this is sort of the momentum we needed to actually take that curve and increase the, the slope a bit. You said before that your firm invests in more of the back-end structuring rather than the product itself. What's the benefit of that, and what's the thinking behind that? So it's, I don't want to say it's easier, but it's definitely sexier to invest in the Teslas. Right. And the Beyond Meats and the Impossible Foods and, and the companies, the consumer facing companies uh, that we're all excited about and enjoy and talk about and things like that. Um, but the companies that are building the infrastructure are often the ones that are actually lacking capital the most because most venture capital firms are not actually uh, managed by engineers or scientists. They're also in, managed by finance folks. Right. And. Ferrari drivers. All right. And, and the, <laughs> the more complicated engineering that we're going to require and that we're going to need to invest in um, is not exactly what VC is currently looking at. So mm -hmm. I think there is a gap for one in the market. But I also think I had a chance to speak to now one of the, I won't name the company, but one of the biggest privately held still uh, plant-based food companies that's out there uh, with the CEO a couple of years ago. And I had asked him, um, what he saw as like the biggest challenge for his company. He's like, just making more of this damn stuff. Right. Scale. It's scale. 
Mm. Right. And so if we can enable the technologies that actually build the bioreactors or that can scale a lot of the downstream technologies, then that's not something that the consumer facing companies would have to deal with because they can take the off the shelf machinery. They can actually pluck the better battery. They can take all the components that they need and focus on the actual end consumer product innovation, which often comes with branding and marketing and so much more than the actual thing itself. And that's great, and we need more of that, but we also need to make sure that when one of them works, that they have the technology ready to actually scale it. And I think that's where the really interesting part of investing comes in in terms of our thesis, is that when we can invest up the supply chain, we actually sort of have a bit of an information asymmetry into each of those potential downstream innovations, and it allows us to really invest in what is necessary to actually allow them to grow. What excites you most at the moment? What are you seeing that you want to put your own money into or that gives you, a, a, from an, a, a perspective of, of solutions that can be scaled? Because you mentioned the plant-based meats and I'm not convinced by them. You know, I, I've actually looked, so my wife's a nutrition expert and I've, studied cell biology for the, probably the last 15 years it's my armchair it's the thing I go to in the evenings <laughs> and in fact before you came in I was actually just reading a new report on the effect of tetracyclines on certain huh. um, certain viruses they're an antibiotic but anyway so this is my sort of fascination but I looked at the um, uh, impossible meats and that doesn't is it impossible meats or impossible foods I think it's impossible foods impossible is foods the, yeah looked at that obviously because I lived in the US and they had it in whole foods and I mean I didn't and my own little analysis of the ingredients. There's no food in it. <laughs> there's a bunch of... No, I'm not putting you on the spot. Don't worry. But there's a bunch of seemingly synthetic type things in it. That, okay, we will... Yeah, we'll reduce the impact of raising meat. Which, by the way, there's an argument that if you raise it very differently, it doesn't have the same impact. In fact, one of the number one ways of carbon sequestration... In fact, it's the number one way of carbon sequestration about over 200 different approaches is in regenerative agriculture. Mm. And the, there's a necessity to graze cattle and sheep. Yeah, mm -hmm. ruminants, exactly, on the land because what happens is when they actually, um, when they graze, it causes the root systems to respond. They get stronger and they go deeper and they bring in more CO2. So, you know, there's that argument to it. Um, so but that's very different from the current system we have where we're contributing to grain it, in, and yeah. soy that is causing deforestation. And that, yeah. yeah. So so there's a then there, there needs to be a, a shift in how we and it's why I put eight billion here about the people because <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. But there needs to be a shift in how we do it. It's not what it's not necessarily what we're doing it's how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I look at these a, a lot of these new ish companies that come into the marketplace that seem great and people get behind them and they start clapping their hands and rallying behind them and but um there's not quite as much uh, thought that's gone into it so it as a as an investor how do you balance the the desire to actually get behind a company that is better than what is currently happening but knowing of course that there it's maybe not ideal it's not perfect do you just do you, do you wait for the perfect company or is there some variation in your criteria yeah i would say it's sort of a it's almost like a portfolio construction question right so it's the impact that a company is having the market readiness of people of, of supply chains to actually take up whatever it is that they're building. Um, and then the, there's the financial side of it as well, right? So which company is yeah. actually going to be successful and make it? Yeah. And I think you do have to balance them all, right? Like if, if you're just optimizing for finding the Teslas, sorry, you're probably not going to be a very successful investor, right? Um, then on the other side of things, if you if your goal is to you know, 10x your portfolio or more and you're just investing in the safer companies, that's probably not really going to work out for you out there. So 
I think just as when you talk about it on like the financial metrics, the same thing is true in terms of market readiness and in terms of the actual impact that a company has as well. And I think I sort of look at it as the transition and then post transition, right? So like what what is the world that we want to live in and how do we invest in the companies that are going to enable that? But then how do we also invest in the companies that are going to get us there? And the companies that are most exciting are the ones that sort of live in that future, right? That live in the vision of the world that we want and in which case might not necessarily, um, yeah, might not necessarily, that are more per- more of the perfect, right? And then the transition companies are the good enough, mm. right? Have you seen any perfect companies? Not yet. Because it, it's taken Patagonia 40 years of holding probably the cleanest, highest intention. Mm -hmm. Because I know the mind of somebody, I shouldn't say that. I know the style of thinking of somebody like an Yvonne Chunard, who was a dirtbag climber. I was a dirtbag rock (laughs) climber for a good 10 years of my life. And there's a, such a deep satisfaction in just living in wild places with nothing that you really don't care about getting rich or famous. All of that stuff actually becomes a hindrance. And so I, I, though I don't know Yvonne Chunard personally, I know people who do and are very close to him. And it's, it's not a ruse. It's not a marketing piece. The guy doesn't care about making money. You know, he lives in a simple house in the forest and blah, 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 blah. drives an old pickup that he runs on <laughs> recycled oil, uh, vegetable oil. And so he can very easily push the company whilst keeping hundreds of people employed, thousands of people, push it towards a an outcome, a mission that is to save the home planet. Everything they do, they make clothes, right? But yep. people like to buy clothes. They're either going to buy from another company, a North Face, who are not as environmentally sound, or they're going to buy from Patagonia. Let's hope they buy from Patagonia. Um, but somebody like him has the wherewithal to be able to do that because he has a different perspective on life. Uh, the big challenge that we have, of course, is that the majority of CEOs who set up companies, they do it because they do want to become Elon Musk. They do want to become a Zuckerberg. They do want to become a... And the number one, for me, so I worked in, uh, when I was in Venice, I worked with hundreds of startups. I was mentoring and coaching them in a lot of their presentations and the likes. It's one of my other sort of work lines that I used to do. And um, you know this, but the number one factor it's not the idea it's not the concept it's whether the team running yes. it so do you have a <laughs> do you have a filter yourself when you're looking at teams to figure out whether they're doing it to become rich and famous and that's fine that's if that's what people want versus whether they're they want to become a bit rich and a bit famous but they're actually doing it because their motives are based on impact for the planet yes how yeah. do you navigate that So I think a big part of it comes down to their story. And to be fair, you can sort of fake your story. You can be a good storyteller. You can sort of, you know, know how to pull the heartstrings. But I think a lot of founders are, can can be good storytellers. But more than that, you sort of see a bit of that glint in their eye and a bit of that craziness of I will not stop until I solve this problem. And I think it's that passion that ultimately, at least for me, is more investment worthy, right? Because even if they fail at their first iteration, they come up with something that just absolutely doesn't work, that's not going to stop them. It's just the first milestone that's going to get them towards where they actually want to be. And it's the commitment to addressing the issue, to actually solving the problem that I think is so powerful and makes it so that you know, it's sort of the last thing you think about before you go to sleep or the first thing you think about when you wake up and you're just constantly sort of obsessed with this issue. And I feel like this sort of circling back to a conversation we had at the beginning where it's how do we get people to care more? Mm. Right. And then when someone does care more, how do we get them the resources necessary to actually build the thing to do the thing that they care about um and i think that that sort of the the filter for me is not where did you go to school it's not who do you know it's not any of those things that i think can be some of the metrics for others um but it's how much do you care about the problem you're solving do you think you'd invest in my flower arranging company 
You know, um, when I first walked in here, uh, can't say I was particularly inspired, but... Uh, but you're inspired by my motivation, your... <laughs> aren't you? I mean, those are in here just for you. I just want to make that I, clear. I appreciate that. Actually, I like the big yellow one. So that's, a, a... that's an English sunflower. So we, we grew those specifically make, so that I feel at home here in Bali. <laughs> so a, a couple more questions just to wind down before we um, hopefully... Yeah, oh, look at that. We've been going an hour already. Um, I mentioned... The, earlier on you were saying about 8 billion people and we've just touched on the fact that there are there are well so one argument is there's too many people on the planet the other argument is there's not enough people on the planet because from from a bigger population you're going to get more brilliant thinkers and as you start to resource countries that have typically not been resourced let's say we could name a half dozen African countries that there could be the next Elon Musk, the next, the environmentally conscious Jeff Bezos, because he's not, obviously. The amount of box and paper that comes in oh. Amazon package is unbelievable. Um, but that's okay, because we're firing him off to space and he can stay there for all I care. <laughs> so, and then we can scrap his big super yacht and we can break down the component down parts and, and make children's playgrounds into... with some of the pieces from it. So... There's the, and the argument about too many people, too many resources being used up, but then a bit like the argument around, well, if we don't use ruminants to graze land, then we're missing the opportunity for the number one way to, to sequester CO2 and all of that manure and that doing it properly. Um, do you have a, a, a thought on, as populations get bigger, because they will, it's an undeniable, uh, certainly in the developing countries, not in the West, there is actually a decline in population. In, in some countries, it's catastrophic, like mm. in Italy, where they're predicting in 20 years' time, there's not going to be a decent didn't workforce. South Korea also just sort of implement a bill to actually incentivize their population to oh, have children? Right? I believe so. Oh, I didn't know yeah. That. Was I reading the other day somewhere, which fascinated me, which was, um, oh, in Iceland, which has one of the most liberal approaches to sex where there a woman if she comes onto a man in a bar it's there's no none of this nonsense kind of sexist shaming that happens in other countries and it came about because one of the population got so thinned that the one of the kings said basically he did a great and this is hundreds of years ago uh, they did a great marketing piece that said pregnant women are to be really honoured in society. And so he lifted all the current, the at the time, decency laws that said you couldn't sleep with whoever you wanted and said, go for it. You can have as many partners and as... No, you can have as many children from as many partners as you want because they were trying to repopulate the island. And so this has stayed with the Icelanders to, to the point where people actually go to Iceland. This is an article, I think I was reading it on Medium. People go, men go to Iceland because they think that every women, woman there is running around <laughs> rampantly throwing themselves. It's not quite that way as you might imagine, you know. Um, anyway, so that's a bit of a uh, tangent. I wanted to tell us that little uh, narrative. <laughs> but let's say we have 8 billion people. Um, if we have the ability to sustain 8 billion people in a different way, then, or 9 billion people, or 10 billion people surely it's you know there, there's the opportunity here for us to actually work on a, a a better approach to our systems and a better approach to our policies i don't know what the u.s population is doing but if and when and i have every i'd bet money on you getting into a political position if you don't just have enough of it and say screw it leave it to the old white men i'd bet money on you even only knowing you for a few hours so now you have to deal with the fact that you are probably going to have to face these big population issues 40 million people almost in california right um nearly half of that would be latin american that's in I certain think it's areas a bit less but yeah a bit less yeah so i i read i don't know if it's true it's a statistic that by 2025 maybe 50 percent of the population of california will be speaking mm. um spanish spanish hmm. so and and, you know, there are Americans who are being born, there, of course. but they're being born into Mexican parent families or El Salvadorians or wherever. So you have a multi, all of this diversity. How do you, this is what I'm getting to, how do you, knowing what you know about what's available out there, 
and I know you're not allowed this time to say about about from the policy perspective if tomorrow you started integrating systems to support 40 million people across California what would you do so would you would you start making sure that broad scale solar would you start making sure that everyone use electric vehicles would you go to regenerative agri- agriculture would you ban all plastic throwaway packaging what would you and the reason i'm asking is i want to get some insight into how you see the practicalities of this i like people to listen to this podcast and go okay maybe this is how sharina lives her life right how do you live your life? did you fly here on a private jet by the way i did not fly here on did a private jet i did not no Come on. no no unfortunately you sure? not you did turn up on a nice little moped i was uh, i was reassured by that <laughs> that you didn't turn up in some big it's suv no the, Amer- the americans uh, have arrived i've uh, i've uh, completely assimilated into the the scooter game you here. have you? i have yeah. i have well, at least i'm trying to okay so um, the practical so the practical bit so i think policy okay right. all right so the two bits that i think where we need to start first is rooftop solar i think california can be powered by solar for the most part we obviously have wind and a couple of things but i think rooftop solar is just a really easy way for us to build a decentralized energy grid um, in a way that most households in california could actually survive off of they, they could create the own energy that they need um, is that legal in california yes. can you yep. can you cut yourself off the grid so you wouldn't necessarily be cutting yourself off the grid but you uh could have a very low reliance on but the grid. can you cut if you want to i believe so yeah yeah okay. yeah because in some places you're not allowed to do okay that. no I, I don't think there's any regulate i could be wrong but i'm quite sure that there's no regulation yeah. against that in california right. so i think rooftop, rooftop solar, solar that's tip. that's like a really easy way to get households and buildings and in especially built environments in bigger cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego to just entirely be energy independent as it as their own sort of decentralized energy system. So I think rooftop solar is one of them. Um, I think the other piece that is actually particular to California because we actually uh, sort of supply quite a bit of the food for the US and the world comes down to agriculture and I think regenerative agriculture is actually a huge component for I mean I don't know when you think about the avocados and strawberries and uh, nuts that are grown in California and the amount of water and fertilizer and the deterioration of soil and how we're having to dig deeper into uh, the water table and that is actually increasing salinity and a lot of other issues that are actually reducing the yield and the size of yield the, the actual fruits that we're bearing um, isn't it's it just, just a huge problem. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I think uh, uh, maybe we'll fact check this later. But <laughs> I think it's like a gallon of water for an almond. It's ridiculous. It's, it's like some inst- it's, <laughs> it's a lot for one almond. Yep. It's yep. absurd. Yep. Almonds and pistachios, avocados, berries. I mean, they're all really water intensive and they're actually not grown in parts of California that have a lot of water, right? Um, okay, so Regen Ag, good. Tip. Regen Ag. On that one. Yeah. So I think those are the two that I would if I had sort of a magic wand with terms of policy and sort of investment into systems that we could sort of kick off. Uh, but I've, don't worry, I've given you an unlimited budget. Ah. So so what next? EVs? So not, not necessarily for do, personal use. Do you drive use. an EV? I have a hybrid, um, but I think EVs are a part of it. I actually think that um, buildings are, it's a lot less sexier, but like heat pumps <laughs> And actually sort of managing energy consumption um, from buildings. Granted, if we had the rooftop solar bit and they could actually use all the energy they needed and it was all clean, then that could be a different story. But depending on the order of operations of all of these, um, I think more efficient, like a more efficient built environment um, and investing in materials like sand and concrete are obviously incredibly problematic. Um, And that's we're continuing to build, we're continuing to develop, and so is the rest of the world. And so I think being able to invest in materials and making our buildings uh, more energy efficient is actually the third piece, which is not nearly as exciting. But back to the EVs, um, personal vehicles, sure, but actually electrifying fleets like trucks, I think would actually make a significantly larger impact. A lot of California, and I believe you said you had spent some time in LA, but the five, right? The big highway that sort of pounds through all from north to south uh, is filled with trucks and a big part of California and some of the biggest issues we have with environmental pollution uh, in California actually comes down to warehousing and logistics. And uh, the trucks, the 
trains and uh, the warehouses have some of the largest footprint because of just how big California is, because of the ports we have coming in from the west, the port of Long Beach in particular, and how all those goods are then distributed across the U.S. So uh, I think that's another big area that is impacting, of course, the environment, but also health. And I think uh, one of the biggest issues, for example, in my district where I was running um, is actually pollution for kids, right? It's Mm. one of the, I believe, somewhere around 40% of all e-commerce goods that are distributed across the U.S. pass through our district. So if you think about what that means in terms of just pure operations and emissions that are associated with that. Um, Yeah, you have stalling diesel trucks in front of elementary schools, and we've seen, I think, like over 30% increase in asthma, Mm. right, and things like that. And I think that's that's where the the social and the health and all these other issues sort of layer on top of the environmental is when you look at sort of the building blocks of what are we eating, where and how are we living, and how are we moving around, and how is all of that powered in terms of energy, you can sort of break down the issues that we need to tackle immediately. And I think some of the... Those would be your three. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't just say plastic straws. Uh, it's, it's a really um, controversial piece. Plastic pollution is obviously a huge problem, but I think it can also be incredibly performative to just ban plastic bags and bland plastic straws, especially in Western economies where pollution in terms of like litter and things like that is not as big of an issue. But it's sort of like an easy win to be like, oh, and we're tackling climate change because we banned plastic straws. It's like, yes, it is a good thing. But is it going to save the world? No. Well, none of it's going to save the world individually. Is Fair it? enough. Fair enough. But I would actually, I would argue that it's one of the most low impact. Yeah. 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 However, in a place like California, no, no, but however, the it's representative of a necessity for change. And I think that's where it comes in. So my kids won't use plastic straws at seven and ten, but they haven't got the faintest idea about EVs or the benefits of using solar panel. I say not the faintest. They're a little bit more exposed to it than most kids, maybe because I do this podcast and we talk about it a lot. They'll want to know what we spoke about, for instance, but they won't listen to the podcast. Um, they're seven and ten. <laughs> they're watching Mr. What's his name? Mr. The guy who has ten, a hundred million followers. Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast. They're watching him, unfortunately. Sorry, you can't compete against Mr. I Beast. I can't compete with Mr. Beast at the moment, no. I, I, I should have told you that we've only got a couple and a, two and a half thousand followers of this at the moment. However... We are going up. We're doing a lot of marketing behind it. <laughs> well, I think so, the updated interior decoration will help. I think it's going to help enormously. So I think these kind of, I mean, it is, it's obviously it's important to take plastic out of the system. Yes. You can't do it overnight. You're absolutely right. I think a lot of people get behind it and think that because they got plastic straws banned in their neighborhood that they can go sleep well at night now. But anything that's representative of a move towards positive change I think is is useful. I agree. I think I think there's two sides of the same coin, right? I think one side is sort of this performative aspect both politically and as an individual where you're you recycle and you don't use plastic straws and I don't know, you eat locally, but in terms of the actions you can take as an individual that would actually have the most impact on climate change, those are they don't rank Absolutely. Um, But then on the flip side, by doing those things, are you more likely to vote for a a, a political candidate who cares about the environment potentially? Right. And so it's it's sort of this like low hanging fruit entry into caring about your environment that would make you take higher impact actions that maybe if someone wants to implement a carbon tax you might be more open to it because you're aware of climate change, you're aware of the impact on the environment, you're aware of all of these things and of plastic and of pollution and all these things that impact your your literal nearby proximate environment um, that will then enable the larger systemic change. So You're in one of the most heavily taxed states in America. I believe the most heavily taxed I think state. I think New York so. might be higher. Uh, depending on what you're taxed on, but yeah, yeah, we're we're up there. But you're up there, thirteen percent state tax, and then the 
cost of i mean people go up to oregon to buy shit don't they because there's no state tax there on get on items goods. yeah i knew friends who would go and get their all of their apple goods up there and then smuggle them back in across the state line <laughs> which is not illegal just in case you're wondering. um but what do you, living in California, and it seems like you're a committed Californian, what do you think of imposing carbon taxes on an already overtaxed citizenship? I would now, argue... Now, now I've put you on the spot. I know. I, of course, am I pro-increasing taxes, especially on like a pinched middle class and lower income class? No, of course not. Um, do I think some of the largest companies in the state could pay their fair share of taxes, yes. Um, as, once again, I, 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 I feel like I keep pounding the point, but I think individual actions are important, of course. Will only individual actions be enough to combat climate change? No. We need the systemic change. We need to have government companies. We need to have scale in terms of the changes that we're implementing. Um, and Along that same line, I don't think individuals should bear the cost of it necessarily either. Yes, maybe your Apple product might be a little bit more expensive. Yes, maybe we need to increase the cost for certain goods and services that potentially already serve a higher income class. Um, but I think it's it's more along the line of a, of a progressive tax system as opposed to a blanket carbon tax on every single person. If you have to get in your car to commute to work and support your family and you're making under $400,000 a year, maybe your taxes don't need to increase. But if you're a massive conglomerate that uh, can afford a bit of an additional tax to make sure that your entire life cycle of emissions is accounted for. Is $400,000 a year the new average in California? It's not the new average, but it is the, the current limit for federal tax increases. So, oh, is it? Yeah. So okay. I That's believe what... any of the new taxes that are being implemented, I believe if you make under $400,000 a year, you're not. I thought you just pulled that, pulled that number out because that's what you and all your friends were making right <laughs> no, now. No, no, definitely not. No, I think that was in the last piece of legislation for uh, for increased taxes. I think it, it the the barrier was at 400K, which is a lot of money. And if you're making 400K, yeah. even if you're making 200K, yeah. that, that it, it's a yeah. good amount of money and you can bear a bit more of a tax. Is it comfortable? Do you are does that sort of introduce some of the arguments that I think most capitalists will make? Yes. But is that then paying for all of the impact that your consumption is having? Also, yes. Funny story. So well, it was funny to me at least. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago I brought in new accountants. Uh, I've lived here for two years and I filed my I, I file my taxes. And the accountants, and I won't name them because I, I didn't actually go with them in the end. We, we've we gone with a different company. But they sat with me and I said, so this is what I earn. This is how our business structure is. This is what I pay myself as a salary here in Indonesia. This is my overseas net, uh, assets, etc. And I said, so um, my understanding is that the tax system works like this. And, you know, I'll be if I pay myself a dividend here, it's a flat 10% ten, 10 rate. It's a very, very, very tax um efficient country and they said and i said so I'll, I'll pay my you know i'll pay myself dividend on top of my wage here and i'll pay my 10 percent here and i'll pay my 30 percent here because that's the highest earning of the tax bracket and they looked at me and they said why do you want to pay tax <laughs> that's the accountants here yeah and i said well i live in this country that's developing and if i don't put any money in it mm -hmm. it will stay developing and will never become developed because how else are you going to get and they said oh you're the first person that we've actually spoken to who actually wants to pay some tax. So I don't want to pay too much tax, but yeah. I do want to pay my piece. And um, and here in Indonesia, it's very much a, it seems like a voluntary process. Mm. You know, it's not a very efficient tax system. Um, on Indonesia, my last question for you is, what do you think of Bali? You've been here, what, a week now? Week Just now? over a week. Just over yes. a week. Yeah. What's your, uh, so you come here on holiday, but you're also doing some, Yep, visiting Business a friend meetings. and uh, taking a look at some of the companies that are doing some really amazing things, I think, here as well. Um, and I think there's so many parts of it. There's the personal side of it, which, as I mentioned, as I rolled up on my scooter, I'm already starting to feel like I'm getting my way around the island a little bit. Um, 
But in terms of the innovation, I think is actually quite astounding. The number of companies here, particularly what we're seeing in terms of sort of local innovation is really fascinating. And Can you name one or two? Um, I can't at the moment, um, but they're mostly working in water and agriculture are sort of the spaces. Is that because you're not allowed to say? Yes, NDS, they're, yeah. they're in, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's it's sort of solving local problems with sort of local innovation. And I think that's the the most exciting part about finding new companies is seeing something and saying, ah, that, like I wish that worked better. And someone's like, ah, I have an idea and I'm going to try to make it work better. Um, and then being able to give them the resources to actually test it out right uh so i think that sort of level of like experimentation and playfulness that's associated with some of the local issues is something that i haven't really seen before this place mark my words hear it now (laughs) in 10 years when this podcast is still running i'm going to refer back to this particular podcast this place in 10 years if not before will be the green utopia of planet earth the government here and the governor are hell-bent on getting the place back to it's called Kawista. And it means a balance between community, human life, and nature. And there is such a high priority on restoring this place to a harmony, whilst also ensuring that people can live their hopes and their dreams and be, it can be economically sound. And in the, I again, a bit like you, I, ha, I know some of the initiatives that are taking place behind closed doors that long term are going to be so beneficial. The organic farming, turning everything organic here. Um, I was reading the the 48 page document on the electric vehicle rollout here, where, as you've seen, traffic's a problem here. Pollution's a problem. That's all going to be done away within the next few years. By 2030, it could all be completely EV. They're, they're doing a battery uh, a, a petrol engine to battery conversion um, process for all scooters. Wow. So the whole place could be electric vehicles by 2030, 2031, something like that. And I genuinely think that this place is going to be something of a utopia. We'll fix the garbage problems. We're all, you know, there's plenty of people doing that. We'll, well fix that's what the you're working on. I'm working on that. Yeah, we, we it, but again, it can't be about catching other people's garbage. It has to, we have to work on stopping at the campaigns source. to stop it at the source and i've got some ideas mm. on that as well on how we're going to do it so um and you're here for a few more weeks yes i'm here through the end of the month so Wonderful. if you're building something in bali um reach out yeah exactly well will this uh this podcast will go out um early next weekend we actually do have quite a few people in bali that listen to it ah, so um fantastic. but i've also got a network that i can connect you into as well uh thank you um sharina so much for coming in i know it was a little bit sort of last minute last week is there anything i should have asked you that i didn't i think we, we covered a lot 20 years from now when we you're running for the president Oof. You, uh, we'll have to talk to my head. he's he's okay with me running for for congress but he's like president's a whole other that, is your husband yeah doesn't want you yeah fair enough well also because you. i mean it's i think that completely changes your life so i don't know actually know if i have presidential ambitions i don't know if i want to be a lifelong politician but i do want to get it and just kick some ass yeah yeah, good. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. you have I I can't vote, but you <laughs> you you have my metaphorical vote. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, much for taking the time. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Mm-hmm.